Greetings, Acolyte, and welcome back to the Ordo Grigio, the Emperor's secret society against the enemy that is, unpainted models. Today I'm using a dishcloth to turn some of the old guardsmen models into hardened veterans. Now one question I got asked many years ago when I was building an Astra Militarum kill team was how I made the scrim on the helmets. So I decided perhaps it would make a good video, and also I wanted to do it again because 1. I think it looks cool, and 2. I found a bunch of old guardsman sprues when I was setting up my new 3D printer. So I'll remove these models from the sprue and clean up the tabs and mould lines, let's talk a little bit about Scrim. Scrim has been attached to helmets since at least World War II, where it's a form of netting applied primarily to the helmet to try and disguise the shape of a helmeted head, to try and avoid, well, being shot in the face, or at all. Camouflage and concealment is a large part of modern military tactics, and I imagine it would be much the same in the Imperial War Machine. No matter what fictional universe you're a part of, being shot, well, sucks. Though most guardsmen are reasonably fresh out the factory and, for the large part, cannon fodder, there is a unit within the roster where it makes sense that such tactics would be employed, and that's hardened veterans. These are the guardsmen who've survived long enough in the maelstrom of war to be, well, effective really. Typically they are fielded in smaller units, squads rather than platoons, and are trusted with missions of greater importance to the overall war plan, as well as holding key strategic locations in larger scale battles. So if anyone within the Imperial Guard ranks would benefit from a little extra camouflage concealment, then it would be these guys. So now, assembly is much the same as for standard guardsmen, though to reflect their extra preparedness, I have chosen to attach their pouches, which I normally don't do with basic guardsmen. In my head canon, most guardsmen are just punted onto the battlefield with what they can hold, whereas the veterans, with a higher life expectancy, come prepared with extra ammunition and water canteens, etc., as they may be tasked with operating beyond the front lines. As well as attaching their belt kit, I also leave off the head for now, as it makes the next step a little bit easier. This step is where it gets a bit weird and fiddly. Grab yourself a cheap and nasty dishcloth, yeah that's right, a dishcloth. I got a pack of 10 from Amazon for about £2, so 20p a cloth, and one cloth will easily do a full squad of 10. For this I'm using two types of super glue, a thick gel and a thin liquid, though if you're only going to use one I recommend the thin as it makes the step later on a bit easier and neater. I cut the cloth down into workable sizes, making sure I have plenty of material left to cover the head and then some, as it's always easier to remove excess material than to add extra in later. Then I drop a super glue on the top of the head, and stick the head in the middle of the cut up dishcloth. Then once all three are glued in place, or however many you're doing, we wait for them to dry. Once the heads are dried and secured in its little cloth basket, it's time to get the fabric glued onto the back and the sides of the helmet. This might be the most fiddly and annoying bit, as the cloth will absorb and pass through some of the glue here. A little bit less with the gel glue, which is why I'm using it, though you will still stick your fingers to the head, probably several times. Maybe using gloves or tweezers could help you out in this stage and prevent this, make it a bit easier, but I didn't use them. Once you've got the sides glued down, then it's a case of coming back in with scissors or clippers to clear away the excess material and make sure the model can actually see past the scrim. When trimming, you do want to make sure the scrim goes past the edge of the helmet on the sides and back, however, as we're trying to disguise the shape of the helmet, but also not obscure the face. It's a fine line and it takes a bit of patience and faffing about. It does take a little while to trim it right, as too much will ruin the effect and look more like camouflage dreadlocks than an actual helmet scrim. The cloth is still a bit flexible here, so before we seal the scrim entirely, we glue the head onto the model and push it into the pose we want. As they're still soft, the strands will naturally fall into the model's shoulders and look a bit more natural, and they can be pushed out the way if they would obscure the connecting point on the neck. Now, you could have glued the model's head on before putting the scrim on, but personally I find it much more awkward to do so but whichever way suits you best is up to you. Once the heads are glued in place and secure, it's time to crack out the thin super glue. For this stage, it is 100% better to use the thin glue, as being a liquid, 
the material from the dishcloth will soak it up, so get your glue and dab it all over the helmet scrim. This will soak into the material and when it dries it will be rock hard and ready for paint. I tried this with the gel glue and it didn't absorb anywhere near as easily and it did actually start to obscure the detail and bridge some of the gaps so it wouldn't look as good. At this stage it does kind of look like they're wearing a silly hat instead of a helmet and a dishcloth is nowhere near the right scale for helmet scrim on a 28mm model but this scale sometimes things need to be exaggerated in order to look right on the finished model. Once it's painted it does look a lot better and the texture of the cloth really helps to sell that camouflage look though this idea probably won't suit models painted to stand out from their environment. On to painting. Unusually for me I've gone with a plain grey prime through my airbrush and I'm starting with leather brown from Army Painter as I'm following the scheme for the Guardsman from our beginning painting video using just the paints from the Army Painter beginner set. So all the cloth of the fatigues and pouches are painted with this colour, as always thinned with a little bit of water to help the paint flow and prevent any brush marks. I'm debating whether I can incorporate these veterans into the same regiment as the platoon I painted previously as NPCs for the 3rd edition campaign I'm creating. Perhaps the platoon and basic guardsmen are the ceremonial troopers with a little experience of real conflict, where the veterans use more standardised gear as it's more fitted to fighting out in the marshy surfaces of the planet. I would likely kit them out with special weapons like the grenade launcher and flamer, as they would be fighting a closer ranged battle against maybe the orcs I painted in the last video. Once we have covered the cloth and get onto the helmet scrim, I thin the paint down even more. When normal painting is full fat milk, for this step we're closer to orange juice. Randomly jab the colour on in a random pattern, the extra thinning of the paint will help it soak down into the recesses and texture of the cloth and provide a little subtle variation, though let's face it, we're painting guardsmen not the Mona Lisa. Make sure you leave plenty of areas of scrim unpainted as we're going in with the green later on. Next is matte black for all the boots, belts, webbing straps, piping, bayonet grips and the exposed section of the water canteens, anything that would be leather, rubber or plastic. Ideally for blacks I would use an off black, like a really dark grey, so that there can be a bit of depth later on with shading and highlights, but for how little this is on the models and sticking with the paint set I'm using, this colour will do just fine. Looking back now that I've painted these models, I probably would start with this step next time, as the straps for the webbing are quite fiddly to get to while trying to avoid the brown around them, but any mistakes I make here I come back in and clean up with the appropriate colour later. It really pays to take your time with this step, and I switched to a smaller brush for this. Mistakes with heavy colours like black are harder to cover with lighter colours like brown or green, and may require a couple of layers of paint to hide properly. Then onto green skin for the weapon casings and flak armour of the guardsmen. This paint out of all of them except the blue from this set are the most awkward to use I think. If you don't thin it enough you get decent coverage but the paint's too thick, though if you thin it to the right consistency as a normal paint the opacity is pretty bad and definitely would require a second coat if I was aiming for a higher quality of painting. Though for these guardsmen I'll just be making sure the areas are the right colour as a wash later on will hide most of the inconsistency and it adds to that battle worn veteran look. As with the leather brown once we get to the helmet scrim we thin it a little bit more than usual and dab in a random pattern onto the cloth material, making sure we leave brown showing and we can even leave some of the areas grey as it will be tinted by the wash later on and give a bit of variance to the brown. After the green skin I did a round of touch ups, fixing mistakes and pondering the many mysteries of the universe and life and everything. I also decided how I was going to paint the flame fuel tank. Then I moved on to plate mail metal for the belt buckles, bayonet blades and metallic parts of the weapons, being extra careful this time as I didn't fancy another round of touch ups and the previous colours were drying on my palette. I've said it before but this metallic is quite bright, especially for our more camouflaged battle worn models, however I'm sticking with the theme I used previously and the wash will darken it down a step. For the flesh I used barbarian flesh. The name may have given away that it's a skin tone here. I didn't thin this as much as normal as I wanted finer control going into the small areas on a mostly painted model. 
and just wanted to get decent coverage in one go, as the more times I go back into these areas, the more chance there is I'll make a mistake and have to do more cleanup. This is one of the steps that has really helped out by the new camera angle I'm trying out, as I have a bit more room to rotate the model and can actually get my beady little human eyes a lot closer to what I'm actually doing. The final step before washes is some matte white for the Aquilas across the model. Using the side of the brush and little dabs to just catch the texture. Getting into the recesses here isn't as important as elsewhere on the model, as the wash will settle in the recesses in the next step. I was tempted to switch this out for brown on these models, as bright white badges don't really make too much sense on a soldier who's using scrim to disguise his silhouette, but then it is also 40k and the Imperium's a bit untactical sometimes. So let's keep with the theme from the previous Guardsman video and keep it matte white, again taking my time to try and avoid any mistakes. Now onto the step that ties the whole model together, washes. I use strong tone from the army painter and cover the whole model in it. I'm starting with a scrim on the helmet and being very generous here, as it has a lot of texture and I don't want to get quite a bit of saturation. We want total model coverage here and I'm using a larger brush than before so that I can apply it quicker. It is called quick shade after all. And I'm actually starting to understand why it's sold in a tin so you can just dunk smaller models into it to shade the whole model in a single go and I might have to pick up a tin when my bottle finally runs out. Once the models have dried from the wash they look a bit like this. They're still recognisable as regular guardsmen and you can see them next to the guardsmen from the basic video, however they are kitted out just a little bit better and more suited to making it through to the end of the mission. They're just different enough to be noticeable as a different unit, and painted well enough for an NPC faction, if I'm even going to use them for that. Again, I've left off painting the bases, as I'm still unsure which army I'll be including them with, or if I'll make an entire new regiment using up all the old Imperial Guard miniatures I have in various boxes all across my house. The technique of using a dishcloth as scrim doesn't have to be limited to infantry models and helmets though as I have used it in the past as cam netting on vehicles, and it could even be applied to scenery and fortifications, as this is also a common military tactic, and I may show this later on. As always, thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed the video and took away something useful from this quite cheap and relatively easy technique. If you have any other suggestions, leave them down in the comments below, and I'll see you all next time.